Okay, so um, hello again everyone here in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre and hello to all of you joining us in this live uh, streaming of our event um, today. Thank you all for being here and for those of you um, online. Now what we're doing today is uh, to explore whether the kinds of rhetoric we see in Shakespeare and, and the, especially in his play Julius Caesar whether those devices, whether the kind of rhetoric in the play is used by politicians today. And you'll find out that we've got a politician here uh, with us. Or is it, and this is really important, or is it that rhetoric has no place or power in contemporary politics? So as I say, we've got a, a fantastic panel here to help us discuss uh, this issue. And I'm going to ask uh, each of you in turn, if you would, just to say who you are, uh, and, and what do you do? Let's start over there with Sam. I'm Sam Leith. I'm, um, a, I write the Otter Persuasion column for the Financial Times, and I'm the author of a book on rhetoric called You Talking to Me, Rhetoric from Aristotle to Obama. So that's my sort of excuse. Angus? Uh, I'm Angus Jackson. I'm the director of Julius Caesar, and I'm also the director of the whole Rome season here at the RSC. So I've directed shows here in the past, uh, but I'm responsible for the decisions uh, that brought Julius Caesar to the stage this time. Patsy. Patsy Rodenberg, I teach voice and text to actors and politicians. I am the imposter. I am the Member of Parliament for Stratford-on-Avon, the Member for Shakespeare. Um, thank you for having me here this morning, and thank you for bringing me back to this panel. OK, so I hope you find out in the next uh, half an hour or so um, that we've got a wealth of knowledge here. Um, we've got some questions that have come in from you uh, online and also question from our, questions from our audience here in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. So we'll try to get through as much of that as possible. Angus, I want to start with you because of your, your pivotal role in getting, getting them, these plays uh, um, on stage. Um, I just want to ask how you approach working on rhetoric and what you discovered about the way in which Shakespeare uses rhetorical devices in Julius Caesar. Yeah, well, we, we, it's interesting because you can go through any routes. We, got, we had Sam in the rehearsal room to talk about rhetoric and we were, obviously there's a book on uh, there's the Aristotle way back in the day. But the key, in a way, and this is uh, fun to do, is look up Obama's speeches, uh, look up... Um, David Cameron's Bloody Sunday speech um, and see how politicians are using the techniques of, of rhetoric now. So when Obama talks about himself and his background, it's classic. I know you've been with Sam talking about it this morning, ethos saying that he is one of you, which is what Mark Antony does with friends, Romans, countrymen. So um, I think that's, that was our way into it, is, is if you look at the way uh, somebody like Trump compares to somebody like Obama or somebody like David Cameron compares to Theresa May or Ed Miliband, um, you, can, you can map those very, very simply onto what they're doing in the Shakespeare play. And it's great to get small chunks of Shakespeare like that and, and just really work out exactly, give it the scrutiny, because it's all there, all the reasoning is there. Um, that they, they, they choose to tear you off in a direction exactly as contemporary politicians uh, and How do. important was it for you to feel that... that these rhetorical devices that Shakespeare uses, that they are actually relevant today. Does that matter to you as, as, as a director? Are you just getting on with Shakespeare? Oh, you're never just getting on with Shakespeare. I think you're always looking for the things that mean something now uh, 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 that we can recognise. When you recognise when he gets his wife up on stage and talks about her being barren in front of everybody, that it's um, a brutal thing to do to somebody who, who you're married to, or you recognise when Mark Antony turns during the course of his speech to saying, you're all going to benefit, we, Caesar's left you lots of money, so you have to be on his side because you're his heirs. And it's, it, it, the thrill of, of recognition is what you're looking for when you're putting a play on. OK, so I'm going to go read out a question now that, that's come from, um, from our audience here in the theatre. By the way, I know none of you are shy, but if you ever feel like chipping in, I don't need to say that to you, Nadine, <laughs> but anyway, chipping into any of these, just, just do so. And um, it's my job to try and contain it all within the next half an hour. So this question came um, from Amber, and, and here it is. If everyone knew about the use of rhetoric in politics, do you think it would change... Um, how campaigns are formed. So if we knew what politicians were up to, would it change the way in which it, politicians frame their campaigns? Let me start with you, Nadine. Um, would it change anything? I mean, political campaigns have to be rooted in um, ideas. 
So that there has to be a sort of a logic, the logos bit of, of rhetoric. Um, without it, the campaign, however good the campaign manager, you know, if you've got the great Linton Crosby or uh, some of the Obama... Linton Crosby, claim, by the way, is a person in sort of the back rooms who's helping, uh, in this case, the Conservative Party <coughs> put together their campaign. That's right, that's yeah. right. and he helped um, uh, John Howard in Australia and, and, and many others. Uh, but no matter how good the campaign manager is, how, no matter how good the communications team are, if uh, the, the logic is not there... Uh, the, the campaign falls apart. Ultimately, you cannot get your candidate there. Uh, of course, it does matter, you know, character, um, uh, which I think Angus was just talking about um, with, with Obama, um, does make a huge difference, i.e. if people... The holy grail in politics is the authentic voice. That is, you know, what every politician is striving for. I spent, before becoming a politician, 10 years doing research as the head of YouGov, into all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's probably the toughest thing for politicians. You know, if you're a bit too slick, then you're seen to be... be that's right. Sam, I mean, you, you studied rhetoric. You've written uh, a book about it. Um, what, what do you think? I mean, do you think it would change the way we look well, at politicians? I think, I think rhetoric is constantly in a process of changing because it's always adapting to an audience or a new means of transmission or a new medium that it's coming through. Um, I think there's definitely the case that the, the more wised up the public gets to the particular rhetorical tricks and turns that can be worked on them, um, the more subtle those tricks and turns are going to have to get. It's a sort of arms race because nobody quite likes feeling that they're being practiced on, that they're being persuaded against their will. So the sort of this authenticity you describe as the holy grail, that is the, the ultimate aim is the oratory that doesn't declare itself as oratory, that, that persuades without being, you know, while being seen to be sort of absolutely straightforward, as when, you know, that classic line from Mark Antony I was returned to, you know, I am no orator as Brutus is. I mean, you know, if you can fake sincerity, you've got it made. See, you know? the thing is, you just use that word tricks. I don't know if you noticed it, tricks. And that's what kind of worries me, and I suspect worries people here in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, both in our audience here and online. Patsy. I don't think people, I think people know when they hear a trick. What I would want is every school child to learn these tools, to use their voice, to know how to listen to ideas. Because I, I don't think people are stupid. I think we can teach people and, and education should be much more spoken and much more structured around speaking. Because then you have an audience who can hear authenticity, who can take an argument and go with it. I mean, I think we've seen in Trump's world, you know, people were not following arguments. I don't think it's because they're stupid. I think it's because they haven't practiced speaking. If you but, think e but, but equally, I mean, you mentioned Trump and, you know, he's not popular among some people and popular among others. But you can take a great orator like uh, President Obama, who kept saying, yes, we can, yes, we can. And actually, we found out that, no, we couldn't in, a, in a lots of senses. So can sometimes rhetoric be a trick? In other words, persuade us to, to believe something that isn't necessarily going to happen. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, listen, uh, you, you know, Sam and I talked about this, but uh, we we're going into an election. Strong, stable leadership, right? Um, do we believe that? Take back control was the Brexit slogan. Um, uh, you, you have to, to have the confidence and the ability to be the interviewer on Channel 4, to cast yourself in that role and go, I don't want to listen to what you want to tell me. I want to know the answers to my questions. So you, you want to say, you get what comes to you often. And I mean, I think this strong, stable leadership thing, they're saying it so many times. They're sort of going through to a, a meta place where we're expecting them to overcook it. And they're hoping that it's going to go in anyway. So, yeah, I think it's the, the confidence to say, I don't want your message. Rhetoric can be for the good as well as the bad, you know. And that's a key point, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I think if somebody says this nation is dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal, um, that's possibly a really good idea to then hang in the air for the next 100 years. I'm not, I think it's true that others aren't. So you've got to maybe be able to have the confidence to pick through them and be a bit stubborn about it. So is it, is it then, Sam, essentially is rhetoric a bunch of tricks no, that well, I can learn to use and then I suddenly become a rhetorician. Well, I become an orator because I've learned the tricks. I mean, it's, it's, the thing is, rhetoric is kind of inescapable. So what we call bad rhetoric, you know, evil rhetoric that's going to trick us, is 
but what are you going to fight against it with? You know, politicians are always going to have to campaign, and the good ones and bad ones alike are going to campaign in words. And my argument really is that rhetoric is anywhere that language is, anywhere that language Absolutely. and power is. And it can be used for the good and for the bad and the so-called tricks. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, there is an anxiety about rhetoric being sort of guises and, and closing and tricksterishness. But actually, a lot of these are, when I say tricks, I'm just meaning they're ways of patterning language. They're ways of making language more pleasurable to take in. I mean, part of why Shakespeare uses so many rhetorical figures is they make the language so rich and so beautiful and so energetic. Um, um, and, you know, Cicero thought that the offices of rhetoric were to move, to educate and to delight. And that all those three things yes, I was going came to together. You know. We have to delight the ear as well. But I just think of the 1500 people standing, the working classes in Shakespeare's theatre, uh, standing. Yeah, they wouldn't night. have been sitting down like No, this, they would have no. been standing. And they were delighted by this language. It was, it, it's fun, it can be fun. And I do believe that anyone can be taught it. And okay. we will hear, the more people who are taught it will recognise when it's not authentic. Okay, so that's, to answer the question, we, we've taken a while to get there, but the more you know about rhetoric, the more likely you are to, to, to rumble, if you like, to expose the politicians who's just using the yes, trickery. Okay. okay, let's move on to, and this is a question that came, uh, 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 online question, um, you may recognise it, one of you. Uh, thinking about modern politicians, who uses rhetoric really well? Um, who uses rhetoric really well? Hillary Benton, when he delivered that speech. So you better just tell our... So Hillary Benton was, was the shadow foreign secretary when we had a very important debate in Parliament about Syria and... Uh, whether this country should get involved in the conflict in, in Syria, yeah. whether, in fact, this country should bomb Syria. Would mm. that be fair? Yeah, and he was in a different place to his own leadership. Uh, and he closed the debate. I have to say, it was one of those moments... I still now, when I talk about it, I get goosebumps at the back of my neck, where you feel privileged to be in the chamber to hear such extraordinary oratory. Okay, so Hillary Benn, that's one, and um, I, actually I, I heard the speech, I watched it, because I had to report on it uh, on the news at six, uh, and it's really worth trying to, to pull up um, when you, when you get, um, get, go online. Patsy. Well, I think Obama is a wonderful speaker, and I think he started to really speak from himself and not rely so much on speech writers and suddenly that, that door opening. He was a wonderful, he is a wonderful speaker. Now you said something interesting there. You've chosen Obama because he spoke for himself. Well, from himself. From himself. From so. himself. The authentic voice. Okay. There's no mask on him. He comes and he has the, the courage to be not only logical but moral. So, so rhetoric isn't just about Sam's devices, you know, breaking it down and seeing how you, how you structure it. It's a, channeling a something. But it's, but it's also yes, got it's to be channeling. authentic. It's got to be authentic. But, I mean, the only problem here for politicians, and it, this applies to Obama, as I think it did to Tony Blair. I think, you know, Tony Blair was very much sincere in his, you know, first campaign in 97, where 20 years, I think, to the day, when he won that election. Um, you know, I don't think he went into number 10 Downing Street thinking that I want to you know, make really bad decisions. As for Obama... Well, that's and, an argument. There's an argument and, about well, whether they I was, were I bad that's a rhetorical debate. To my point here, <laughs> as with, with Obama, with the, with the red line on Syria, um, you know, both politicians eventually have to hit the brick wall of decision-making. And sometimes those decisions don't go so well. Okay. And actually, the rhetoric then plays badly in Syria, to the Syrian people, for example. I, I guarantee you, they wouldn't see Obama as being um, you know, honest and sincere and speaking for himself when he spoke about the red line. So, actually, the, the, the thing about the red line, I don't know how many of you know it, but when, President, when Barack Obama was president, he said, if the Syrian government used chemical weapons, that would be a red line. If you do that, then that's something the America will have to intervene about, will have to take action, and he didn't. I mean, what's interesting about what you said is whether something is good rhetoric or bad rhetoric kind of depends on where you stand, doesn't it, in an argument. So what was, at the time, seemed good rhetoric to us here turned out to be bad rhetoric. When it you could also saying. be about 
context and temperature. I mean, going back to Julius Caesar, I mean, the, the mistake that I, I think Brutus makes is that he addresses the, the crowd in prose, which is less formal. It's like the best man making a, a speech at a wedding that is not quite appropriate. He didn't quite get the right... <laughs> he didn't quite <laughs> get the, the right tone. Yeah. Uh, and I, then, but but then, then Mark Antony brings the whole thing up into verse, and that is very powerful. And I think that... I'm standing with Obama, but I think sometimes he might have got the, that context wrong. But I <laughs> still think... You know, I think it's a really great leader who should... Allow, who couldn't allow a tear to come down and with Sandy Hook, the, ki the killing of those children. His heart, very few people... He wasn't afraid to be emotional. Yes, and then they were... Then he was, you know, people were... laughed at him, but I think that's an amazing moment. Of course, mm. 20 children, you mm. should have somebody that shows mm. their feeling. Angus, you, do you have a uh, favourite well, politician? I, a well, he's, absolutely, he's not my favourite politician, but I think David Cameron's Bloody Sunday speech is worth looking up. And it's interesting because it's something that had gone on, this inquiry had gone on, uh, you know... Just in a nutshell, tell us what Bloody Sunday was. Um, uh, in a nutshell, some uh, uh, paratroopers, uh, soldiers uh, working on behalf of the British government went into uh, Northern Ireland, which was a, where they, there were... Um, riots which may or may not have involved weapons on behalf of the, um, the, the Northern Irish people and uh, lots of them were, several of them were killed including some uh, young people and the inquiry that went on for years and years and years, this event predated David Cameron being an MP, Prime Minister or even an MP and the inquiry came out and it basically, without using the word murder, it said that, um, that the British government were responsible and that it, that it was a woeful and regrettable, I can't remember the exact words of it. And as I understand it, David Cameron was given a speech by his civil servants, by his speechwriters, uh, to look at over the weekend to deliver. And that he decided to make it very much about, uh, he, he set that on one side as I understand it, and he made a speech and he talked about how the events had happened before he was in power and how what, what was he supposed to do and he said you if you're looking for the word murder in this inquiry uh, you won't find it and then he found a way which i'm not going to attempt to try and find exactly the words that he used but please look it up it's fascinating to take responsibility and apologize and it was it was it was played out to screens uh, in the community where these lives had been lost oh many many years ago and they they there was the huge, uh, the response was palpable. And if you think of some of the things we have to deal with in terms of whether or not we apologise for things that the government have done, and it goes on and on and on, are we going to apologise for uh, slavery, for example? Um, the line that he walked and the way he humanised the argument through himself, and I think without question, he would have regretted the, I think we all regret these events without question. And the way he found to do it seemed to appeal to everybody. That was really clever. And, and, and it's a universal thing, isn't it? The question of, of how do you account for something that went on in the past? What language do you use to explain what went on, to apologise? You know, it's, whether it's the Australians with the indigenous people, whether it's the Afrikaners uh, with, with black people in South Africa, whether it's, it's Canadians and First Nation people, you have to find the right language. I mean, it's, so it's David Cameron in this instance, but it, it's something universal. Um, Sam. Well, I, I'm slightly in the, in the Obama camp as well. I don't think there's been anyone quite like him, um, except I think there is a distinction to be made between the congressional beverage. I mean, I come to this mostly as a sort of literary critic, really. And so when I say, oh, I love Obama as an orator, that, orator that's kind of a literary judgment. But of course, actually, rhetoric is an instrumental art and it's how it works. And does it work? Um, you know, and you can be ugly but effective. And I think that there's an you know, this sort of antithesis thing, you know, as much as I would like to spend my time studying Obama, actually, why is Donald Trump's rhetoric working when it doesn't seem to follow, in some ways, many of the traditional kind of canons of oratory, it's not well put together. But there's been really interesting work done by some linguists, actually, on that style he's got of never quite finishing his sentences and allowing the audience to complete them that produces a kind of dialogic ethos appeal, much like a stand-up comic. And there's a... You know, we all go, oh, that man can't speak. And you go, well, he, maybe he can't speak, but he's won an election. So he's doing something right. And I think I'd that's be, interesting. I'd be interested, um, just why don't you think about who, because I suspect your answers might be different. If you've got a favourite politician, or it doesn't have to be a politician, actually, be a musician or whatever, 
who you think uses language really well, let me know. I, I won't put you to the test right now, but I might come back if we've, if we've got a moment. Let's move on now to, uh, this time it's a question that came uh, from the audience here. It's uh, from Isabel. Um, how good a substitute is Twitter, uh, stroke social media, for rhetoric in, in the traditional sense? And, um, for example, Trump, President Trump is very vocal on Twitter. Does this help or hinder him? So, in other words, social media, Twitter, um, is, uh, is, is that now a substitute, the 140 characters or whatever, a substitute for the great speech? No. Would be do you use Twitter? My, I do, very much so. Um, I, I actually use it in two ways. One is obviously to inform my constituents um, about what I'm doing in Stratford on Avon, but also obviously to then, in a general election mode, to get our narrative across, the Conservative Party's narrative across. Um, where it really comes into its own, by the way, is uh, as a tool f for me, because if you filter it well, it, it is probably second to none in terms of quality of information um, that you can seek out and you, know, you can follow fizz.org, for example, who send you these fantastic you know, 140 character tweets about something in the... I was a chemical engineer out of UCL um, that is happening in physics that I found really interesting, uh, as well as following you know, all the great journalists I mean and... and um, uh, uh, mainly news um, uh, platforms. So, so it's both. So, so it gives me, it keeps me current. Uh, you, know, there's, you know, I can walk into a meeting and I, I will know whatever's happening but, um, but as, as close to the moment you're, as possible. you're in the middle of a campaign right yeah. now. Um, one is not a substitute for the other, is what you're saying? Absolutely not. I mean, it, 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 you know, social media has its place, um, clearly. Um, lots of young people are becoming much more engaged in social media. Um, I spent a, a year being Cameron's, David Cameron's advisor on apprenticeships, for example, and actually the BBC has done some remarkable work on this in the sense that uh, to try and attract much more diverse a, sort of, you know, a resource base of human beings to work within the organisation, um, you know, it's not good enough just to simply open the doors and accept people to walk in because the same sort of okay. demographic walks in. And if you go out and reach young people... Uh, and tap them on the on the sort of electronic shoulder and say, "Hey, you can, you can come through people. this door. Okay. You can actually." Angus, make I, do, I, do, I mean, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but I mean, Twitter famously is 140 characters. The Gettysburg Address, you know, a, a Lincoln's Address was 272 words. They're not quite, you know, they're still short. I mean, I just wonder: in, in is it possible in Shakespeare to move someone? I mean, is there are there great passages or not passages? Um, speeches that are short ones in, in, in Shakespeare? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, yes absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I like walking around just quoting there as a tide in the affairs of men to myself. And it so say that again, loud but and clear. When Brutus makes the decision to go to war, and, this is, and Boris Johnson quoted it when he decided not to be leader of the concert, not to run for leader. <laughs> He's, they, and that, well, the line is, there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, omitted all the voyages of their life, abandoned shallows and in miseries. And I, I, can't, I, I bet you that's inside 140. And it's got a profound truth at the heart of it. And it's beautifully and poetically delivered. So you can agree with it or disagree with it. It's perfectly clear what it means. You strike while the iron is hot or, or perhaps the opposite. So I, I think absolutely yes. But I also think in terms of your question, just to, not to give Trump too much airtime, but if Meryl Streep speaks in front of thousands and thousands of people and criticise you, the new President of the United States, and you tweet, well, she's an awful actress. That's still rhetoric, right? Because Overrated. You, you've, thank you. <laughs> yeah. she, he, you've changed the subject of the debate to now whether or not Donald Trump has any right to say that about Meryl Streep, who's clearly a phenomenal actress. So in a very short sentence, he's, he's, he's stopped people talking about whether or not she's right, right. to criticise I mean, Isabel's question is a really good one, and I don't want to dwell good. on it too long, because what actually happened in that American presidential campaign is that one side, Hillary Clinton's side, relied very heavily on rallies, going and, and talking to people, which is the use of rhetoric. The other side, President Trump, or President... Uh, uh, so CSAM, you've got to go. Um, Take care, sir. 
you use Twitter a lot. In fact, they would, they would change the message several times a day. They would direct Twitter messages to different people at different times of the day. So it's quite interesting um, wh wh why Isabel's question is su such But it can be used for good. It's like, it's, it's like rhetoric, you know, paradox. The, it can be good or bad. I mean, what I think what happened with Trump is that he did silence with Twitter. And you, you make a, a very complex argument simple. And maybe you could say part of the reason why people enjoyed his Twitter is that they had felt they'd lost expression. Right. That there was something about people having lost their voices. Okay. Now, I mean, let me sort of play devil's advocate for a second. First of all, Trump had massive rallies. Actually, the way he mobilised... Uh, his voter base is having massive rallies that the sort of the mainstream media initially sort of um, laughed at uh, and then sort of begun to think, well, something's going on here. The other thing I very clearly remember during the primaries, one of the candidates, of course, because we're, we're close to um, the, the, our US colleagues, said one of the difficulties with Trump as a candidate is he actually sucked the oxygen out of the room. So the others couldn't even get their message across because he spent 15 years on primetime television. He right. was a celebrity. So he was able, whether it's through a tweet or a rally yes. or a, a, a just a, you know, a, a off the cuff um, put down to one of his opponents. Um, you know, it, was, it was that line about Jeb Bush. You know, he's a low energy kind of guy. I've seen them in business before. He killed him. So, so, OK, so just before we leave Isabel's question, so was he, he, he was using Twitter as a way to prime his rallies, was he? To... Well, I, I think he was using you know, social media, yes, <clears throat> but I think it's a sort of... He, he was such a big celebrity in America, okay. and that sort of cult yeah. of celebrity, right. that he was able to, to suck this oxygen away from his... Very, his very do you think, yeah. no, it's, sort of, it's easier to be, to be damaging with Twitter than it is to be positive? Creative, because you're, you're, you're simplifying something. Yeah. And as soon as you just criticise someone in that way... Or you accidentally tweet about white man van in your constituency. But it, that's it, not about the brevity, that's not about the length of it, because, as Angus has just told us, you can, you can, you can make yes, some important things very quickly in, in, a, in a few words. So it, it's somehow the way we've ended up using this... this but this when, what you're quoting in Shakespeare is poetic as well with imagery okay. and metaphor. Mm -hmm. And that language is not... Trump doesn't use that type of language. He uses a very straightforward... Right. We'll, we'll stop this language. becoming a kind okay. of Trump, <laughs> Trump thing. No, did, no. Um, <clears throat> did anyone come up with their... Fa yeah. He for she. So this is Emma Watson's he for she speech. I don't know it, but that's one. She, she was invited to be a, a goodwill ambassador for girls and women at the UN. She gave this very beautiful, not very long speech um, about how she wished to stand up for the rights of girls and women around okay. the world. Unfortunately, online I can't see you. I wish they, wish they could. But this is a speech she gave at the United Nations uh, on behalf of, of, of women. Emma Watson. So look it up. Anyone else? Very quickly. Yeah. Russell Brand's interview with Jeremy Paxman. OK, good. Thank you very much uh, for that. Now, here's, uh, here's another one, by the way, from the online audience. And, uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes left. Um, what's your opinion uh, of the female characters in Julius Caesar? Would any of them make good politicians, Angus? Oh, yeah. So Portia's magnificent, who's Brutus's wife. And she has that lovely speech, which is actually rich in rhetoric, where she goes, I know that I'm a woman, I know that I'm a woman, I know that I'm a woman, and then gives all the arguments why he should um, share his secrets with her. Um, and I think what comes across is that she's at least as skilled as everybody else on stage in rhetoric. So you long for her to be... In ancient Rome, the women wouldn't have been given formal roles of power. They might have been very powerful, but it wouldn't have been a formal thing. So I think watching her, and you'll all watch her tonight, I think, uh, without question, and she cites that she's Cato's daughter. Cato was a very famous um, senator of the previous generation who killed himself, actually. So, yeah, without question, Portia comes across very well. And then the only other female voice really is Calpurnia, who... Um, tries to persuade him using really wonderful language, fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds, Persu try to persuade him not to go out because she's had a dream that he's going to be assassinated. 
and uh, neither of the men listened to either of the women. And I think our experience in the audience is that <laughs> they, should they really should have done, yeah. <laughs> but she's actually doing something very impassioned, doesn't she? But she's using... Uh, Who's this, Portia or Calpurnia? Portia. Yeah. Portia. She's trying to save her marriage. Yeah. She knows that if, if they're, they're, they stop talking to each other, the marriage is over. Yes. But, you know, for, I want to just champion Shakespeare here. He writes some of the best powerful women on the planet. Not only, not necessarily in Julius Caesar, but women that come in and save the day and use language brilliantly. So um, very quickly, and you're going to have to be really quick. I'm just going to tell, ask each one of you. And this is from Lottie uh, for Patsy. Do you think uh, an education system is flawed by having written exams rather than speech? You need written exams, but you do need people to learn. Um, to, to communicate and memorise and speak out aloud. The, the science coming through is enormously clear, that if you speak information, you remember it longer. And what upsets me is that in privileged schools, you get this, and those people... I come across leaders who've been to Eton and Harrow, and they speak well and know nothing, and people in their co corporation are brilliant, but they can't speak. So we should all be... The education system needs voice and embodiment of ideas. OK, just and very quickly again, Patsy, to you. I have a terrible speaking voice. Is there anything I can do in my daily life? I don't life believe it. Whoever said that, there's no such thing as a bad... Every voice can be improved. Right. Every voice. The trouble is they get rusty and they get dusty. We have to use them. So I have never come across... The vast majority of people have amazing voices, but they get reduced. Think of a baby's vocal folds, tiny little folds, go okay. on and on. So, so, so we can all learn to become. <laughs> we can all and learn to become and, yeah. <laughs> an Obama or a Nelson Mandela yes. or, or whoever. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm afraid our, our, our time's up. Thank you here. Thank you, our audience online. Thank you from our panel, Angus, Patsy and, and Nadim. Thank you for, for giving up uh, your time to be with us. And... Um, that rounds it up for now.